The thought that leads me to contemplate with dread the erasure of other voices, of unwritten novels, poems whispered or swallowed for fear of being overheard by the wrong people, outlawed languages flourishing underground, essayist questions challenging authority never being posed, unstaged plays, canceled films. That thought is a nightmare. Toni Morrison. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a We Need Diverse Books roundtable discussion on what can only be described as a movement to rewrite and erase this country's history. And while in today's United States, that could be a reference to a great many things, for the purposes of today's discussion, however, I'm specifically referring to the issue of book banning that is happening across the country, both at the local and state levels. We here at We Need Diverse Books are deeply, deeply concerned about this issue, with the overwhelming majority of books being challenged or banned, telling stories of people of color, Native people, LGBTQIA plus people, religious, ethnic, and cultural minorities, people with disabilities, and otherwise marginalized groups. My name is Steve Dunk. I'll be your moderator for today's panel, and joining me are four best-selling and award-winning authors who know and understand this issue intimately and who have lots to say. And not just a discussion, it's also a call to action. We will be providing links on how you can help, so look for those after in the comments below or at diversebooks.org. Without further ado, authors, please introduce yourselves, starting with Samira. Hi, thanks, Steve. Hi, everyone. I'm Samira Ahmed. I just want to start by saying thank you to We Need Diverse Books for bringing us all together for this very important conversation. I am a young adult and middle grade author. Um, my first three young adult novels, Lucky and Other Filters, Internment, and Mad, Bad, and Dangerous to Know have all been challenged um, and or banned in different districts across the country. And some of those bands I'm gonna talk about are soft or quiet bands, which I think is an interesting discussion we're gonna be having. Uh, my next book, Hollow Fires, deals with white supremacy. So I'm sure that's gonna um, have a welcome reception in some of these districts. <laughs> um, in, in any case, thanks again for having us. I can't wait to talk to everyone. Of course, Kaylin. Um, hi, I'm Kaylin Bayron. Um, I am a young adult and middle grade author. Um, I wrote uh, Cinderella is Dead, which um, is being challenged in uh, multiple places across this country. And I also wrote uh, This Poison Heart, which um, is being challenged, but um, uh, in a very quiet kind of way um, as well. Um, all of my stories uh, feature queer Black girls, queer Black families. Um, and uh, so it is, it's incredibly disheartening um, what I'm seeing right now, but um, that is, that's kind of where we're at and that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, hello everyone, my name is George M. Johnson. I am the author of All Boys Aren't Blue, which has been either banned, challenged, criminalized in 21 states and counting uh, with Two criminal complaints filed in the state of Florida, one against me personally, a criminal complaint filed in the state of what was that, North Carolina, and in Iowa, um, they are actually trying to pass a law to make it um, a misdemeanor, punishable up to one year in jail for an educator to disseminate my book specifically, as well as uh, four other books um, to students. Uh, I am a young adult author, middle grade author, and I primarily write about uh, the Black and queer experience uh, in America. And finally, hi everyone. Uh, it's good to see all your faces. Thank you, We Need Diverse Books as well for hosting this. Uh, so my name is Marco Shero. I'm the author of Anger's a Gift and Each of Us a Desert, my young adult books, and my middle grade book, The Insiders. All three have been banned or challenged hundreds of times, I've lost count. I'm sure with some of you, like there's no way to, for us to keep count at this point. There's so many of them. Um, my, I have had my books banned since about a week since Anger is a Gift came out in 2018. So it's nothing new. It's just reached sort of a fever pitch uh, in terms of intensity and, and the sheer quantity of it. Um, and, you know, and I'm not naive. Like many of you, I'm not naive. I know why it's happening. Like I write only about queer people of color. Like those are always my main characters. Those are the stories that I'm telling. So I know why my books are being targeted. Um, but excited to talk to all of you about this. Okay, I really, again, can't thank you all enough for agreeing to be a part of this. Um, book banning occurs when private individuals, government officials, or organizations remove books from libraries, school curriculum, or bookstores because they object to their content, ideas, or themes. It is far and away the most widespread form of censorship in the United States at 73%, roughly, with children's literature being the primary target. But it isn't new. It goes back hundreds of years, but for many, the current attack on our freedom, the highest since tracking began in 1990, is something that many are just waking up to. Do you think what's happening today is any different than years past? And if so, how? 
Um, so I'll jump in with that. But before um, I start, I want to make one, I just want to be clear and transparent about one thing because um, for all of my books, my main characters, they are, are not queer characters. So I just want to be clear. There are queer characters in my book. They are not the protagonists. Um, my characters are all, my protagonists are all Indian American and Muslim. So I think that Muslim piece is uh, what's attracting the most attention. Um, but in any case, I think, um, you know, book banning has been around, as you said, for a very, very long time. We, even in high school, as a former high school teacher, I know we studied like the book ban in 1933, the first major book ban, the, uh, the book burning that the Nazis did um, stemming from banned books. Um, what is different now, I think, is two things. One is the way that people can generate attention and try to build fervor and anger about books that are merely about a queer kid going on a fantasy adventure, just existing. And they can foment that through social media, through uh, you know, four years of a former president who like not just upheld that, but like pushed it to the to the forefront of a political space right now, which is allowing us to allowing them to exhibit this like complete bigotry, this racism, this homophobia, this transphobia, and legislate it into existence. So um, I think that's uh, one of the big differences that we're seeing. But also, I hope one of the big differences that we're seeing is that there are more of us who can come together, speak together, and um, ensure that our kids and ourselves are not erased. Yeah, um, I agree uh, with everything that was said. I, I think that the social media piece of it um, is probably the the most glaring kind of new thing. Um, you know, there's this this ability to just kind of put something out there and then it is instantly accessible to uh, to millions of people. Um, and, you know, I think that works both ways. It's it's incredibly disheartening to see um, the social media posts. I, I found out that Cinderella's Dead was uh, being banned in Texas through Twitter. Um, and so it's that part of it is is kind of disheartening. But then I also feel like the 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 other side of the coin is that we also get to have our voices heard almost immediately on on this on subjects like this. Um, we get to kind of say what we need to say, and and our readers and supporters are are there to kind of um, you know retweet and reblog and and kind of spread the word that way. But um, I think um, I think just the social media aspect of it has been has been the thing that is most you know new and kind of different from what's happened in the past. But um, the feeling is not new. Um, you know, just existing as a queer person, um, it's kind of like you know I it it feels familiar. Um, this this kind of backlash feels familiar, but it also feels like there are new and kind of creative ways to to um, to resist. George? Yeah, I mean, I agree with um, everyone's sentiments so far. Um, it's not much, I mean, I, social media clearly is like the biggest difference, um, I think, in all of this. Uh, but I think also like we, the root cause of this is because the demographics of the country have changed quicker than white people thought they were going to change. And I think they thought they had a little bit more time before those demographics were going to change. And the last census showed that Gen Z um, was 49% non-white and 15 identifying as 15% LGBTQ. And I think that is basically what rattled the entire cages of everyone. And so what I'm always telling everyone is like that the book bans are tied to everything else. Like there's a reason that you just had uh, the whole loving case brought up about interracial marriage. And it's because that number is increasing. But if interracial marriage is increasing, that means that those those relationships are producing more children that are still non-white. Um, the whole Roe v. Wade situation, white women are having, uh, like I always say, if only black women and brown women were having abortions, I don't think white men in power would care. Um, but there's a reason that they care and it's because white women still make up the largest number of abortions percentage wise. And on the flip side of that, they have the lowest rate of children in the country now underneath Black women as well as Latinx women. And so when you just look at the numbers, the attack on books is really just the attack on the ideology that 
uh, they are losing their grip of being the majority. And K through 12 has always been the one system where they can indoctrinate you with um, Thomas Jefferson being a great person and Abraham Lincoln being the savior to black people. And they've always historically, generation after generation after generation, been able to tell that same story. Uh, but when I look at my cousins, they don't look at Abraham Lincoln the same way I was taught Abraham Lincoln. And the books that they read break down that those people who were the forefathers were also slave owners and were also uh, these terrible, heinous people. And so they're being indoctrinated with um, a, a new ideology around uh, this country's real beginnings. Uh, and so I think that's really what the biggest difference is, is that uh, those people who are in power are recognizing that their majority grip on the country uh, population wise is slipping fast and that generation Z is not the generation that their parents were and are really, really against a lot of their own parents ideologies. Um, and so I think that's what we're watching happening. We're just watching it play out in real time because of social media. So I love that you use the word indoctrination too, because that's really what it is. And that's what we're being charged with too, is that we're indoctrinating children. And I love that we're getting a chance to like dig into the history of this too, because I agree with all of you. The only part of this that feels new is the social media aspect, like the, the logistics of it, because, you know, I'm, I'm old enough that I can remember the satanic panic in the eighties. That's the, that's what I grew up in. I grew up in, and it affected my family. My mom thought everything was satanic and evil. I grew up in a surveillance family where every book, every piece of music, anything I brought in was heavily, you know, looked through. I had no privacy as a child. Um, I grew up in the age of Tipper Gore and the PMRC. I grew up in the age of uh, I tell the story too sometimes to kids where they with because some of them don't know that there were book bannings recently. They think it was a thing that happened in the 30s and 40s, and then we went this long time without them. So I went to a very conservative school district in in uh, Southern California, where, for example, in our health class, any diagram or page that mentioned what sex was or how to have it or what anything of it was literally cut out. So our health books skipped completely. Um, and the ironic thing, and I think this is a good point to make, is that the idea was if we don't let children find out about this, they won't find out about it. And we will not teach them this. It doesn't exist. The only message we will give is you should wait till marriage to have sex. And don't even like don't even begin to bring up queer people having sex. That's not even a thing we're going to even teach exists. The ironic thing was my high school had the highest teen pregnancy rate in the entire county. And it was because we weren't teaching them anything. We weren't teaching them what sex was and how to have it and how to have it safely if you're going to have it. What it means to you know have uh, sex with safe consent, none of that. They didn't know any of that. Um, and so I think ultimately, I'm glad we're framing it as these are a desperate group of people who realize they're losing their hold on and their grip on people and they're panicking um, because I think that is a good way to reframe it um, and, and sort of build momentum on our side is we know we know we're right and we know that these are pe these people they're desperate like that's really what's happening here um but yeah honestly i've been dealing been queer my whole life like i that, it's not new it's this is not new at all it's 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 what i come to expect from people in power um for many it's a moral issue but censorship violates the first amendment right to freedom of speech uh, even though some limitations are constitutionally permissible when it involves generally agreed upon you know community standards whatever those are um, but they are trying and succeeding to ban books by generally accepted authors as well now, calling into question the very idea of intellectual property. It's also wildly unpopular. The Washington Post polls show that like a high 80 percentile of people oppose the, the banning of any books for any reason whatsoever. What do you guys think will reach the hearts and minds of the average citizen? And what's the more powerful argument, the morality or the legality of it? Um, okay, I know I'm supposed to go, but that's a very tough question. I, I, I mean, I actually think I'm thinking about this um, a lot lately, um, paired with gun control. I mean, I know they seem like completely different, but here the fact of the matter is, like, all of these people are willing to, all these politicians refuse to legislate anything about guns. We're not going to ban guns. We're not going to prevent access to them. In fact, we're going to make it easier for you to get them. But the thing that's really going to hurt people. Not the fact that like, hey, there's been school shootings. First graders have to hide and practice hiding and being quiet because we're just like letting guns go rampant. But you know what's really bad for these kids is a book, mm -hmm. a book with a queer character, a book with a brown character, a black character, a Muslim character, a Jewish character. 
I mean, I guess I see the weight, uh, the moral and legal um, weight is almost sort of equal to hearts and minds. I, I feel like we have hearts and minds, but what we need to do is get those hearts and minds to who agree with us to speak up. I mean, I think people know that book bans and book burnings are wrong, right? But people, there's a lot of people who are afraid to speak or don't feel empowered to speak or are worried about like, you know, cancel, getting canceled or people saying bad things about them. And, you know, I spoke at a, recently I spoke at a, a, a teacher event, an English teacher event in, this, in, in Kansas. And a teacher was trying to teach my book and was told she couldn't because another teacher complained about internment and the teacher was afraid to challenge it because she is a single mom and the primary wage earner in her house. And she said, she asked me this question, how can I be brave? And I thought that was like such a poignant question. She was a white teacher teaching in a virtually all white school district. You know, they don't have Muslim kids in that district. There were no brown kids in her class. And I think that that question felt so poignant to me because I felt like she was trying to be brave just by bringing it there. I don't want a teacher to lose their job because of teaching my book, but I want the community to come out and support them. Like I was a former teacher and I can tell you right now as a former member of my union and as a taxpayer, those two things are critical. So like every teacher, every teacher union out there, I want there to be a groundswell of support for all the teachers who are saying like, we're pushing back against book bans because it's not American, it's illegal and it's just plain wrong. And there have to be local parents and local stakeholders who will say, you know what, I'm going to come out to the school board meeting because I guarantee you if any one of those school board members gets 50 calls from a local district in a day, their phones are going to be, that's going to be unprecedented for them. I am really asking parents and local stakeholders to find their courage to speak up about this. Our kids will be harmed by this. Children will be erased by this. And even if your child isn't queer, even if your child isn't black, even if your child isn't brown, queer that you know of, you need to speak for all of our kids because your child, even if they're not any of those intersections, needs to have that voice in their life. They need to have that story because that is who we are and our shelves should reflect our world. Sorry, I don't mean I don't even know if I answered that question directly. <laughs> I apologize. I just like sorry. Kaylin, follow that. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think I can. Yeah, I don't know. That's no. Um, yeah, I I think um, I think gosh, I, 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 I I think yeah, I, I think it's a really important issue because some people aren't are, you know are, everyone's brains are different. Everyone's you know those amygdalas are all developed differently, right? Our our neurons, our synapses are all differently. Some people are going to look at this from a legal are going to see the the legal side of this much more profoundly than they than they will see the moral issue of it. There there has to be some people out there that sure maybe don't like the content of your books, but we'll just, we'll die on that first amendment hill. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think there's an argument for both for looking at it, uh, through this kind of moral lens and also through this legal kind of framework. But I, for me personally, um, it's just, you know, there's this laser focus on, on protecting children, but it's like protecting which children and protecting them from what exactly. And I have been accused of, you know, trying to indoctrinate children. And my thing is, is like indoctrinate them into what? Into having empathy and compassion for people who maybe aren't exactly like them uh, or trying to let qu these queer kids who exist either, you know, openly or not, um, you know, depending on their safety level, you know, to let them know that I see you and that you're, your life matters to me. Um, so I, you know, and then here I am, I'm a queer parent with a queer kid and my trans child is, is trying to find their way in this world and the world is telling them that they don't count, that their existence doesn't matter, that it doesn't, uh, that there's something wrong. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it stokes this very real anger um, in me as, as just a human being, but I, you know, I, I, I try to look at this and 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 think about how can I how can I move people to to care um, and that that feels that feels 
it feels weird for me because I'm like, you know, how do you look at another person and just not care about all of these kids who are here in these classrooms? And it's like, we only care about the white straight children. You know, we only care about furthering this, this, um, this heteronormative worldview. Um, and it, it just, it, it angers me and it also makes me sad. I, you know, I just, I feel all of these, all of these things around this issue, but I, I think when it comes specifically to book bans and what we're, you know, what we're talking about here today, it's kind of like, I, all children deserve to see themselves. And even children who do not share our marginalized identities need to see us in these positions of, um, you know, in these books about characters who are living their lives, who are dealing with very real issues, who are, you know, the chosen ones, who are, you know, not the chosen ones. It's like we, we have, we exist in these myriad ways. And how can I, how can I get people to just to care about what we're saying here? That's the kind of question that I bump into. Um, you know, all the time. And I don't have a solid answer. I try really hard to, um, to talk to as many people as I can. I talk to young people all the time, school visits and book clubs. The kids are all right. The kids are out there. These young people are really out there. And I think we, I posted on Twitter that I retweeted that video of the kids in Florida and the don't say gay thing that's going on down there and these kids came out and they were like absolutely not and they walked out of their school and they have signs and they're being supportive and it's like you know the kids are all right I, I wish that we would take into account I wish lawmakers would take into account what they are thinking and feeling and I see these kids at these school board meetings um in Kent Washington there were kids who were coming up to the to the to the podium and and advocating for Cinderella is dead and like vocally and, and books like it. And I just, I, you know, I just, I have such an overwhelming kind of um, appreciation for them. I, and I feel there's some part of me that feels like I'm failing them, that we as a society are failing them because um, they deserve so much. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's not, I don't have like a clear cut answer. Um, it, it feels very, it feels very strange to kind of weigh the, the morality of it, the legality of it, you know, and we're just trying to, <laughs> we're just trying to write books and let kids know that we see them and that we're trying to tell our stories. And it's like, and then we have to also fight these battles. It feels overwhelming sometimes. George, I've seen you do testimony for this issue exactly. And it, it almost it almost sort of depends on your audience, doesn't it? So, you know, when you're talking to a school board or or just say parents, you might lean morality, you might lean the legality of it, right? Uh, I mean, no, because we write on both. So I go yeah. with both. Um, yeah. There is a Supreme Court case in 1982 that said that students have the rights to choose the books that they want in their libraries. You cannot go against that. I mean, it's this, I mean, and that's why I said like, that's why they're doing these illegal abortion bans in these states because they want the Supreme Court to review Roe v. Wade. They literally are doing this because they want the Supreme Court to review the 1982 PICO case. Like we're not stupid. Like this is clearly a, a, the, the final straw in the strategy because they know that we have that case as precedent on our side for students. Uh, so as long as the students make enough noise about not taking a book out and can refer to that case, they're having to put the books back. I've watched several states. Every time the ACLU has gotten involved, the book has been put in back. Every single time, because literally the precedent stands and you just literally, a school district cannot go against a Supreme Court precedent. So legally we, are, we have the law on our side, not just the first amendment, like, you know, it's like even beyond the first amendment, there's an even more specific case about this specific thing. Um, so legally, We've got it. Again, I've had every criminal complaint against me thrown out in counties with Republican sheriffs. Like legally, they just don't have a leg to stand on with this. So I think any legal scholar is probably like, yeah, legally, the, the people with the books, and the authors are right. So that's the easy part. I think the part around morality is like the much harder conversation for people to have. Um, not for me, um, because, you know, I think I just think about where we, you know, as a black person, I know where we were in this country and where we've come. And so you have to tie morality to where you are socially. And so there was a time people thought it was moral to have slaves. 
<laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so the whole notion of morality really is built in, one is built in uh, cis heteronormative whiteness um, because they're the majority. So they determine what's moral and what's not. Uh, but two, as time changes, the morality of things change. And so we are now in a generation where the youngest generation has a lot of queer people in it and has a lot of non-white people in it, which means that morally, the way that we view morals is going to change. There was no such thing in 1980s and 1990s as 16 and pregnant. That's a whole franchise now. So the whole notion that, oh, they're being introduced to sex through our books, it's ridiculous because 16 and pregnant has been on TV for over 15 years. Um, the whole notion of, oh, well, you know, this is why we shouldn't have gay marriage. We have shows that are called Married at First Sight. So the whole notion of marriage being an institution in this country is BS now, right? Where that used to be one of the most sacred things you could do in this country. We have multiple shows where you could date 20 people at a time and marry one at the end. And you can get married at first sight or you can find love at lockup. And like, it's like, so that's actually what the moral compass is of the country, you know, the president of the United States was a reality TV star. That's the moral compass of the country. So I think when we talk about, well, where are we morally? It's like, yes, the Bible is always going to be the Bible. But at the same time, it's not 2000 BC anymore. So we have to shift what even what quote unquote we think is moral, right? Um, Stonewall was 1969. So prior to, you know, post Stonewall, you saw all of these um, gay clubs basically became a thing, right? And now you got gay clubs in every city and gay bars in every city and you got gay hoods, right? Like that's a thing now, right? So I think, and so I guess to, to sum it up, that's where I'm at with the moral. It's looking at where are we at in society right now? And how do we now determine what this generation actually needs um, to grow and to prosper and uh, to be great people. And they need more diverse stories. They need more diverse characters because they are in classrooms now with trans people and in classrooms now and their best friends are trans or queer or Muslim or mixed race or you know a myriad of different things. And so they need to understand one another's experiences across the board. Yeah. Um... Boy, it's real hard to follow all four of you, or all three of you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just add that for me, because I also, you know, Samir, I also run into the same thing too, where I'm having teachers reach out to me and, and librarians who are like, I don't know what to do. Um, and those situations are really hard because I'm the same mind. Like, I'm like, oh, please don't lose your job over my book. Like, it's a book. It's fine. My, I'll be fine. You keep your job. That is way more important at this point. Um, and I... And I am often very struck by this dichotomy of, well, do we go the legal route or do, do we go the moral route? My, my gut from all these years of having my whole life challenged, like my entire identity has been challenged since I was a child, um, is that the people challenging it are morally bankrupt, so I don't care anyway. Like they just are, like, and I'll say it, I don't care. All these people who are ahead of these things, your, their morality is trash. It is terrible. It doesn't even make sense in context of itself. Like these are people, generally speaking, who have a very specific strain of American Christianity, who literally do not even follow the things that Christ taught them at all. They don't follow them. So I don't care to engage on a moral aspect. So I will say that a thing that I, I was having a conversation with a teacher and their students a couple of weeks ago during school visit, and we came up with this idea where we want some of these school districts that are having these bans become legal and in some way legal, I say, obviously they're not, but uh, we want more malicious compliance. We want people to be like, oh, you don't want to have books that make kids feel bad? Oh, I'm sorry. We can no longer teach a separate piece by John Knowles because that makes every non-white kid feel terrible because where the hell are we in that terrible ass book? You know, oh, you guys can't read the Bible because there's too much violence and sex in it. Oh, you can't do this. And we want those books to start getting banned. Like we, not, none of us actually want books banned, but we want that to start happening as a way to be like, oh no, we've bit off more than we can chew. How can we you know, erode these legal challenges or whatnot by showing them that the thing you're doing is actually gonna hurt you too. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I, you know, I, I, agree with, I agree with George, like the legal part, we do have the basis for it. I think we need to keep fighting it. I, I am hoping they continue to fail on all of these fronts as they, as they put all of these terrible cases through the courts or whatnot. Um, so yeah, so that's my thing. <laughs>
Can I just add one thing to what Mark said? Because I loved it so much. Because I, I said the same thing to someone. I was like, all of these things about discomfort, you know, like this is creating this discomfort or whatever. I just want there to be a parent. And it really needs to be a white, cis, het, Christian parent who stands up and says, the Bible, which is taught in a lot of schools as literature, has violence in it. There's sexual violence in the Bible. There is like, a, there is, I want one of them to challenge it. Look, and it's gonna make them feel awkward as hell. And a lot of people in the community are probably gonna come down on them, but they, I guarantee there will be others who will support them. I just want someone to do that. When we're talking about local action, someone do this, please. Yeah, I was, gonna, I, oh, go ahead, I was gonna add to that too. I mean, typically, and just like one of the talking points I use most often because every now and then I get set up and they will put me on with a conservative mother but they didn't tell my team that I was gonna be on with a conservative mother. Um, and so I love those because those are always fun. Um, but typically when they say something about my book, the two, the two things that I always go to are Romeo and Juliet. And I always ask them, well, why don't you have an issue with Romeo and Juliet? I said, it's a suicide team. You know, I said, one, Romeo was like 27, she was 15. So you have a whole issue there. I said, and two, um, they both, you know, died by suicide at the end. And I was like, it's a suicidal quote unquote love story. They usually can't respond to that because they don't realize they don't, they never think about Romeo and Juliet from that lens. So that it's hard for them to then respond to it because they're like, oh. And then the second thing I always bring up are the Greek and Roman mythologies because we're all taught Greek and Roman mythology. And so I always bring up the story around Medusa, Hera and Zeus and how Medusa was raped and how we were taught that. And that's why Hera cursed her to be a Medusa. And usually they get stuck. And so I think that is actually a really strong part in like the whole morality is when you bring up these very, very classic things that we know we all have been taught and you kind of flip them on their head. Like, well, you're trying to attack us with this particular thing, but why are you not saying this about these particular things? Um, so yeah, Mark, that's a really great point. I also want to add that part of what I would love to see happen in this context, and we we saw it when they set up that tip line to report people uh, who were possibly providing abortion access to it, is let's just flood the hell out of these things so much so that they have to shut them down. Um, yeah. And so that's what I want. I would love to see that in a school board thing where like 30 parents in a row get up and just pick some inane detail from a book and be like, well, you can't have this book because it has this thing in it. Because the whole point about this is, is why this is happening is none of these people care about context at all. They just pull something out and they're like, you're teaching this. And it's so absurd because I'm like, how is that teaching it? You were just teaching that it exists? Because I mean, that's ultimately what it is, especially when it comes to queer and trans content is they just don't want us to be acknowledged. And I think about like middle school me in my school where we were not allowed to have queer books in, in the library and how often he because I heard I remember books being banned when I was a kid and hearing the things in my district that were not allowed and all that told me little kid in the closet was oh we don't want to talk about you at all like that didn't make me feel safe it didn't do anything but make everything worse so you know they don't care about context like it's you know so let's not care about context in reverse um this one's sort of a toss-up, whoever wants to take this one. There's a narrative going around that I really want to sort of try and just crush and destroy at this very moment. This idea that banned books are good for sales. Anybody want to take that one? Who can I'll I fight? Who? I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Go, George, George, George. I'll take it because I am also like being, I am being the most um, challenged around this one because I think it's my book that is probably the catalyst for the argument. So I'll take it. Um, <laughs> for some, ban banning my book has been great for sales, right? But it also is because I was very vocal. Like it wasn't just that because they banned my book, my sales rose. It was that they banned my book and I was, I'm was i an activist first. And so you're not going to do that. And so I count, I was very loud and I am still very loud, very vocal every single day, using my platform, doing the television interviews, uh, specifically because I know a lot of other authors are being silenced. And I know that this fight is really, really large. And, you know, even very early on, I think it was eight states had banned me before I made the first tweet. Once the tweet went viral, the news people just started coming and coming and coming because nobody had even realized it was an issue. But the fact of the matter is, no, it, it does not help sales because it's still not 
when you put 850 books on a banned list, how is someone going through this list and then buying 850 books, right? So realistically, what it does is for a few of the books that are being attacked at a very high level, like Mouse, like uh, Anti-Racist Baby, like All Boys Aren't Blue, yes, it increases those sales because those are the most visible books in a lot of the areas being attacked. But when I think about the books that are also typically on the same list as mine, which I believe are like Genderqueer, um, there's a Lawn Boy, um, they're, they're not having the, even though the, those two books appear on every single list that I appear on, they're not having the same type of thing that, that my book is having, but it's also because of the way that I've chosen to take up uh, the fight for my book in a way that other authors don't have to, and other authors shouldn't have to, because this is actually, we shouldn't have to be doing this. It's actually kind of ridiculous. Um, but realistically, uh, part of the work is also how do we shine a light on these books that are being banned that people aren't talking about and don't know about to also ensure that um, these books are getting returned to the shelves and not only getting returned to the shelves, but also getting enough visibility that it increases their shelf space in other areas. Uh, and that it increases, you know, my whole thing with the whole book ban is if you're going to ban me in the library, then I need to create 10 more access points for them to get the book. That's been my whole philosophy around it. And so it's like, then how do we get the banned books in the airport? How do we get the banned books in Target? How do we get them on the stock at Walmart? How do we get them in different places so these teens still have access to them in so many different ways? Um, and so unfortunately, it's probably going to be on the authors to have to create some type of banned book week or month where we're just all sharing a different banned book that's not getting highlighted a day to ensure that those books are also um, getting recognized. But yeah, banning books doesn't necess necessitate a sales increase for everyone. It is very specific and it's very micro. The macro of it is that a lot of the banned books are just banned and nobody knows it and they're just taken off the shelves. Um. This is an issue of privilege. Challenges and bans harm the most vulnerable in communities who don't have access to finances, time, transportation to acquire a book no longer available to them. This speaks to the unique focus right now that these, these groups are really zeroing in on libraries now, which is something that they haven't done. It's usually been schools and curriculum. Now they've really focused on libraries. Accessibility is the issue. These are minorities, mar marginalized communities and you've all fought so hard for so long for so little representation in stories, on book covers. What's the irreversible damage if we go back to a time when the current generation sees themselves erased and the next doesn't even see themselves at all? Samira? Well, I mean, I think you just use the phrase irreversible damage. I mean, yeah. that's it. We, they're, the ultimate goal of these people who are you know, banning our books and challenging our books is to try to ensure that people like us, authors like us, stories like ours no longer exist. They want to completely erase us. And speaking just really quickly to the sales issue, for publishing, it's a business. So like when your sales go down and for all of us who are writing for children, when our books are removed from schools and removed from libraries, we're not getting sales when a publisher sees like, oh, this this type of book isn't selling. They're not going to get more books like that. So that's that's one thing that's taking our stories away. The other thing is this deeply horrifying thing, which is that young people are not going to be able to see themselves in the pages of a book, and every child deserves to see themselves as a hero on the page. Like when you see it, you can be it, right? We say this all the time to kids. When, when our young people can see themselves in the pages of books, it can be so inspiring. It can be that little thing. Like you never know when that book is going to be that one thing that helps one kid who is like really barely hanging on because they are being attacked just for being who they are. Like no child, no identity is controversial. Okay, just like no human being is illegal. And by just acting as if none of us exist, by removing these stories, these identities from our shelves and from our attempting to remove it from the culture, you are causing a psychological and emotional damage so 
deep in our kids. And I say this as an older person who grew up with nothing like me on the shelves at all. And it is a struggle to then like find yourselves in these moments to, to be able to really decolonize your mind, to decouple yourself from like all of these hierarchies that exist and to realize I have a right to occupy this space. My voice is important. So yeah, I'm getting like hot under the collar about this. I, I just can't tell you how horrible it is for a child to do that. And we have made some progress in my lifetime, right? There were no books by Muslim authors on my shelves in, in my school. There were no books by queer authors. There were no book, there were barely any books by black authors except for like Langston Hughes, you know, and like the Harlem Renaissance poets. Progress should always be forward and we need to fight to ensure that happens. Kaylin? Yeah, I, um, you know, I think, uh, I think about the message that, um, that all of this sends to, um, to young creatives. I think about all the books um, and movies and music that might not get made because people are being told uh, every day that they're stories don't count, that their lives don't matter, um, that their experiences aren't worth, um, you know, having on the shelf. Um, and I, I, I think about, um, I think about all of the things that we will miss out on um, if these efforts uh, succeed. I, I don't, I, I don't feel, um, I genuinely do not feel like, um, like these efforts will succeed just because there's so much fight in us. Um, as a, a as a community, um, and uh, you know, we will continue to fight back. But I, I I do think about that sometimes. My mind kind of goes to that place about all the things that that could be lost, and and maybe maybe things that are already lost because this is, you know, these books being challenged and these things, um, you know, they're happening in real time. But that doesn't mean that they haven't already just so drastically affected. Um, uh, creatives who are, you know, who are thinking, okay, well, maybe I don't, maybe I shouldn't write this book, or maybe I shouldn't, um, you know, make this indie film or do whatever, you know, it's, it, it, the damage is being done. And then on top of that, um, and I think probably, um, I, I think we can all kind of agree that, you know, the young people who are just not, um, going to have a chance to see themselves represented, um, that is, that is the thing that breaks my heart the most is I, I think about um, my younger self and how, um, you know, how having books like this might have helped me kind of navigate the world, um, you know, how, it, how I might have uh, kind of figured out who I was and what I wanted and what I stood for maybe a little earlier, or maybe just having something that says, hey, you're not, you're not alone. Um, you know, I, I think about that and that, um, you know, the damage is the damage is being done. And that is the thing that, you know, that I think about a lot is just that it is being done right now. It's not some kind of far off thing that we're waiting to happen. The damage is being inflicted right now. And so um, we, we just have to continue to be vocal um, in our opposition um, to these, to these types of book bans and censorship. Um, but it, 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 it worries me um, uh, about the damage that's already been been caused and about the queer kids that are sitting in a classroom right now and watching all of this happen and just kind of um, feeling discouraged. Um, so it, it, you know, it's, it's like, it's disheartening on one hand, but then it also just makes, um, it's so clear to me the, the work that we still have to do. Um, and so just uh, continuing to do that, I think is how we kind of mitigate all of this, but it's, it's tough. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, I, I agree. Um, it's disheartening. Um, and again, like you said, like some of the damage has already been done um, with, with a lot of students who are watching it play out, who are watching, you know, surveillance, like what's becoming surveillance states around specifically trans uh, kids, uh, but also queer kids. Um, you know, so much so that they're challenging trans people's parents, um, which you know, it's like everything is a parent's right. And then all of a sudden now it's like, well, these, but but parents of trans children shouldn't have rights either because what they're doing is abusing their child or a myriad of just like um, moral and ideolo ideological uh, BS. 
Um, you know, but I do think that the one thing we can lean on, I guess why I guess I'm I'm not like, it's like America always repeats itself. So I'm also kind of like in the mindset of like, okay, this is just their new Antifa. They don't talk about Antifa anymore. Why? Because then it was Black Lives Matter. Then they stopped talking about Black Lives Matter. Then it was like, let's ban all of the books. So midterm elections are going to happen. They'll choose something else. We won't be talking about book bans in this way probably for another 30 years. That's just the cycle of America. Um, the good thing, though, I always say is that we could just that being black means I have ancestors, which is great because I can always look at them, listen to them and talk to them and read what exactly what they said to do during these times. You started with a Toni Morrison quote. I mean, like they already tell us what to do during these times. Um, but the thing is, like Phyllis Wheatley, she was taught to us as, you know, first black woman with a book of poetry. The part they left out was that she was also banned from releasing her book of poetry in America. Um, they leave that part out, right? So like historical precedents, the slave narratives. A lot of people don't know that slaves wrote books. We're only now starting to reread those slave narratives and I'm starting to share them more and talk about them more and, and that there are actually audio recordings that you can go listen to of people who were slaves um, that exist, right? And so like we have all of these like great things from the past that kind of tell us that what's gonna happen, you know, in the present and in the future. Um, and so I look to those type of things as things that empower me. And so I can only hope that the youth, although they are seeing what's happening, they also can be empowered by the fact that they're watching so many of their peers stand up for them and rise up for them. Um, I also think the different thing that they have is connectivity to us because of social media. So it's like if a Morrison book was being banned and you as a black kid in your class felt kind of unseen, there was no way for you to reach out to Toni Morrison. There was no way for you to watch what she was doing. They can watch, they watch me. And I know it because they, they DM me. They watching me on TV and fighting and going hard and it literally riles them up. And then, they, then you see petitions and then you see them marching and then you see them. So I do think about it from, from that way. It's like a lot of damage has been done. Um, and, but I also can see hope and I can see light on the other side of this. Um, and I think what's going to come from this is you are going to see a generation of kids when they turn 18 be really, really fed up and really start to, to tear some things up. I mean, they're already ready to tear some things up. And I think watching that video in Florida, the kids are, the kids, one, the kids are all right. And two, the kids are not going to be last generation, like the last generation. They are totally, totally different. They know pronouns, they know, they know their sexuality. They are very empowered in a way I've never seen a generation be empowered before. Um, and so I can look to that as like the thing that empowers me to keep going. Um, and also Samira brought up a good point when she said the Harlem Renaissance is interesting. All those people were queer and they never talk about it. Never talk about it. But that's also why like our heroes get stolen from us. And so now we're doing that work to put our heroes back into the world. Um, and I think they see it. And the four of us are becoming heroes for this generation, whether we know it or not. And so I think that's the other cool part about this is they have heroes because we're here. We're actually here and we exist and they can see us and they can interact with us and they watch us. So it's not just our books, it's also our existence that's empowering them too. And so I, I think that's the other side of it. As much damage is being done on the book side, the visibility and representation they have because we exist and we speak up and we talk is still just as powerful for them. And I think, I mean, it's interesting too, because I mentioned it earlier, Steve, which is that I, I know what the damage is because I lived it. I know what it was like to live in a, a culture, you know, a very local culture that bans talk of anything people don't want to talk about. Um, you know, I wouldn't have been in the closet till I was 18. I would not, I, I most certainly would have figured out I was non-binary earlier than like 31 or 32. Like it would not have happened in my 30s. It would have happened a lot younger. So there is, there is damage that is happening. And I know, you know, especially for the kids who are in these more insular and royal or rural communities where it is harder for them to get to resources, I, I am worried about the damage that is already happening. But I don't know that it's necessarily ir uh, like irreversible. And I will push back on that slightly because I think about how many things I wish I had known. I wish I had been taught consent. I wish, I mean, I would have known what to do when I was sexually assaulted when I was 19 in college. They don't teach you about consent period, but they specifically don't teach about consent between two men at all, at all. And I wish I had known that. 
um, I wish I had known, you know, how to be my authentic self and what like gender euphoria was and like, and like joy around sexuality or whatnot. But I will say this is that for all those people, those awful, terrible, regressive people tried to shove me down, like it didn't work and I'm more radical than ever. Like, and that's the thing that I hold on to is that they tried to snuff me out and it, they made it worse. Like I probably would not have be, be the person I am today and write the things that I write and center queer people of color in my literature if it wasn't for, you know, I don't know. I just tell people spite is a great political tool and I love it. And I, I think about exactly what you're saying, George, how many of these kids right now are learning a very important lesson about power and about collective power and what happens when they band together with their friends to fight against something, um, which is why that video, Kaylin, that you retweeted this morning just makes me so happy. Because I also think, you know, when I was in middle school and 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 high school 20 years ago, that would have never happened at my school at all. I mean, I know it wouldn't happen because I heard the op it was opposite. Everyone was using slurs. You were not allowed to be out. We didn't have a GSA at all. And so not only do I see that as a sign of progress, but I see that as a sign of what the future holds for us, which is this 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 shit is gonna backfire so badly on <laughs> all these adults. Oh, and I'm just gonna eat it up over here. Like you are making more and more of these kids who many, I'm, I'm certain many of those kids in those videos are not queer or not trans themselves. Wow. And, and they are ready to go up for their friends. Um, and so I, I think we need to make space for the damage that is already happening, but I am excited about the ways that we as a community, and especially the youth are gonna change the fabric of everything for everyone. Um, Mark, I'm not ready to thank those regressive people just yet, but I am glad you are who you are, just so you know. <laughs> um, the last question, the most important one of all, Samira, what can we do? What can anyone do? What should the average person watching this, listening to this do? Um, I was like, just, sorry, I was getting like a little choked up listening to my co-panelists, so sorry. <laughs> I, I actually hate having feelings in public, so, um, mm. but I just am so honored to be on this panel with their brilliance and um i know how important and powerful their stories are so thank you the three of you um this isn't answering your question but i'm just thinking about how i feel so often like i'm a hard person right like every time i see mark i'm like yes anger is a gift and i'm an aries so it's like especially good um but i want our kids to have the chance to be soft i don't want them to have to I don't want them to have to find their courage. I don't want them to have to push back. I mean, I, I love it when they can, and I love it when they find their voices. And like, there was that group of kids in North Carolina who like during that district book ban were the ones who got their school board to back down. And I love that so much. I mean, I write stories about those kids. Um, but what is clear throughout all of American history is that Adults make terrible choices and our children are then forced to find their courage to confront those choices. And I want us adults, I am speaking to every adult out there. It's incumbent upon us to make it better. I don't care how old you are. I mean, I am not a young person. So I don't wanna hear like all the Gen Xers saying we're too old to do this. We actually have power. I have privilege and power, and it's my job to use that for a purpose. And I want every adult out there to do that. Like all of you who are, all the adults out there who are staying quiet because they're a little bit nervous. And I look, I get it. It takes, it does take some courage to speak up, but I'm like, screw your courage to the sticking place because you only have this one life. And our kids are the most precious thing we have. And it is our job to endeavor to deserve them. And I'm asking every parent out there to go to those school board meetings, to overwhelm your superintendent's office with phone calls, with angry phone calls saying, these book bans are not acceptable because you are erasing a child. You're erasing an identity. You're trying to put someone back in the closet and that's not okay. And I just want, I just, wish I could like go out there and talk to every single adult in person and say, this is why you must do this. This is your 
moral obligation as a human being. Um, that's not a lot of specificity, but yes, please call your school board, call your superintendents, back the teacher and the librarian who is saying, no, I'm not taking these books off my shelf. Call your, call your senators, call your Congress people. It just takes one step. Sometimes I know it's hard to find political courage to do this, but I'm asking everyone to take one small step because that first step is like gonna lead you to the next one. Maybe you're not ready to lead a giant march, but maybe you are ready to like get five people out there for your local school board election, and make sure every one of them votes. Find a small step that you can do and do it. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I just, I agree with everything you said. I don't have too much, too, too much to add to that, but I, I do just, I, I would encourage people to, to do what you can and to try your best to, to be as, to be as brave as our kids have to be. Um, because, you know, as adults, we, we have, um, you know, we have the, the opportunity here to to really show our our young people um, how much we value them, and um, I, I never I never want um, these young people to feel um, the the kind of that kind of ache where you feel like you are not being heard or that your life doesn't matter. Um, I know what that feels like. I never want anyone else to have to feel like that. Um, and it's why I took my kid and got out of Texas. It's like, we have to, you have to do the hard thing. Sometimes you have to do, and I mean, it's not a hard choice. It wasn't a hard choice, but you know, sometimes these, these choices feel overwhelming. It feels like, what can I do? I'm just one person. Um, but you, you have to do something, do something, go to a school board meeting, go, um, go to your city council meetings, go, um, you know, network with your teachers, with your librarians, with educators in your area, um, ask them what you can do for them because they, they do have ideas. They do. Uh, people are reaching out to me constantly, um, saying, well, this is what we're doing. You know, do you have any suggestions with how we could help? And this is what we need. And, um, you know, those, those conversations are important. Um, I think, um, I think that for us as creatives, um, what we do is we continue to do the work. We continue to um, to tell the stories and and allow um, and allow these these amazing, beautiful young people to to know that they are valued and that we value them. Um, and so yeah, we just uh, we we continue we continue to do the work. That's that's kind of what it always comes down to. Yeah. Um... I don't have much to add to that. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, the the to Samira's point earlier, you know, um, it's important that people are buying any books that are being challenged as well, because sales equal visibility, visibility equals more shelf space in different areas, which then also allows for other authors to use our books as comp titles, which then put more stories similar to ours in the world. Um, so it's like a whole chain effect that happens on the sales side. So I do encourage people to, you know, buy those books that are being challenged because it, like, like Samir said, if publishing sees that these books can still have viability in the world, they will green light uh, the stories that are very similar or all other stories that are needed. Um, I also agree with Kaylin. Um, something I've been publicly saying is like, if they're going to ban one of my books, then I just have to write 10 more queer books because you can't ban all 10. Um, which is why I have, I think, two, three, four, I think like, like four, I think I have like four more queer books coming. I, I lose count, but I have a lot of books to write. Um, but yeah, as, as I'm, I'm sure my agent has called, we're in the middle of negotiations for the next one. But, um, but that's the thing, right? As a creative, it's like, just keep creating the stories. Um, I also encourage uh, people to, when they try and deny us one medium, to move it to a different medium. And so that's also why I'm trying to adapt my book into a TV series, because if you deny it here, I can give them access here. It's why I created a dramatic reading of the book that was free so that kids who couldn't access the materials, they could watch it on YouTube. Um, there are other ways as creatives, authors, and publishing houses, because we don't always look at all of our subsidiary rights. There are so many creative ways we can get our books out there. 
um, in a different way. Uh, putting up free libraries, the little free library stands. Um, that's something that I'm passionate about and I want to start doing myself in different areas. Um, donating the books to the public library if they don't have them on the shelves so that they can put them on the shelves, if they're being denied access to getting them put on the shelves. Um, and then, like everybody said, just being vocal about how these books make you feel, uh, talking up at speaking up at school board meetings, um, all of those things have been very, very powerful tools. I've watched it in real time work. I've watched kids name their abusers because they said they read the part about consent and all boys aren't blue. So we know that these books are saving lives and changing lives. Um, and so it's just, you know, putting that the, the other side of why these titles are so important to the youth uh, out in the world. Um, and yeah, and parents, you know, it's okay to stick up for your child, like, <laughs> you know, be vocal. My, I, and I say that because I post every now and then when my mother and father publicly are defending me um, a lot more aggressively than I am, but um, my mother and father are very vocal about the people attacking me in my book. Um, and my parents are 60 in the 60s and 70s. So if my parents can literally watch their child be attacked in this way and go hard publicly, other parents do the same. Go just as hard publicly for your kids and your kids' rights. I agree with everyone. I think you all said this beautifully. I'll just take something Samir said and wrap it back around to a, a, um, a number that Steve gave too, um, which is that we have the numbers. We do. They're, the vast majority of adults in this country don't support book bans. So I think the thing that we can do, whatever means that you take, and I love the suggestion of like, you, you should be, we should be reaching out to the people in this community to find out what we can do rather than assuming we know what is best. But either way, I think the thing we can do is overwhelm them. Let's overwhelm them in every space. Let's overwhelm them on social media. We'll overwhelm them in these school districts. We'll overwhelm their emails. We'll overwhelm, overwhelm their phone numbers. Like we have the numbers, let's show it to them. While we're out of time, um, I just want to thank my guests for discussing an issue which I think we can all agree could reach critical mass if we don't fight back. And I think these guests, along with so many other people out there, are doing just that. They're fighting back. You've heard some great you've heard some great ideas on how to do just that, and we will be providing resources on how you can help even more. So look for those after, along with how to find these amazing authors and their books. As always, please remember that we all have a responsibility to take care of each other. So continue to be safe out there and look out for one another. If, if you will permit me one last time, I'd like to end with a quote from Maya Angelou. Let me tell you so much truth. I want to tell the truth in my work. The truth will lead me to all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank great. you.